You may have heard of genes that act selfishly, organisms that adapt in order to survive, ecosystems that behave as cohesive units. Biologists often talk about these things as though they were purposeful, exhibiting agency, directionality, or function. Should they? That's the big question that brings together the experimentalists, theoreticians, and philosophers who are involved in the Biological Purpose Project. This is the Purpose Podcast, where we will hear different interpretations of agency, directionality, and function, and how people use these interpretations to solve real-world problems and tackle long-standing questions in biology. Welcome to Episode 3. I'm Siddhant. Our DNA tells the story of where we came from. Every living thing alive today shares genetic similarities. Which means that if we go all the way back to the beginning of life, we will find our last universal common ancestor, also known by the acronym L-U-C-A, or as I'm going to call her, Luca. Today, Luca's descendants come in all kinds of shapes, sizes, colors. They live everywhere, from deep ocean vents to the International Space Station. Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection explains where all this stunning diversity of life came from, by organisms adapting and changing over time. This one rule of evolution by natural selection governs all of life. But does it tend to produce certain outcomes over others? Does evolution tend to go in certain directions over time? Directionality in evolution is the idea that over significantly long periods of time, evolution is moving in a direction. Scientists have been puzzling over this for some time now. The guest of this episode found the answer to this question by accident. Okay, um, my name is uh, Joanna Maisel. I'm a professor in evolutionary biology at the University of Arizona. My main research areas are evolutionary theory and protein evolution. When Joanna stumbled upon this question, she was trying to figure out how biology innovates. One thing we know for certain that Luca did is it made copies of itself. These copies were slightly different from the original, and the most successful versions survived. And this happened again and again and again for 4 billion years. As a result, some of our genes can be traced all the way back to the beginning of life. But others have emerged more recently. I think a lot of people think that there was a big bang of all genes coming from the primordial soup and since then they've just been versions of the same thing duplicating and diverging from each other but actually that's not how it happens every once in a while a completely new gene comes along born from junk DNA that didn't used to be a gene at all. It may be surprising to know but most of the DNA in our bodies is not genes It's what scientists call junk DNA. It's a bit of a misnomer because junk DNA has a lot of functions in gene regulation. But the key difference between junk DNA and genes is that genes code for proteins. And the phenomenon that Joanna is referring to is when junk DNA suddenly starts making proteins. It becomes a gene. This has happened in our own evolutionary history. Last year, scientists from the University of Pittsburgh and Peking University found 45 human genes that had emerged from junk DNA after we split from chimpanzees about 4 to 6 million years ago. Interestingly, a vast majority of these genes code for proteins that are involved in our brains and our testes. And I was very interested in what facilitates innovation, what makes something more or less evolvable, what the characteristics of something, of a biological object that's just de novo come from nothing are, and that how that differs from biological objects that have been around a while. 
Joanna was trying to figure out what makes some of these new proteins that have emerged from junk DNA different from older ones that have been around since Luca. So we do this technique called phylostratigraphy, which means looking at cohorts of proteins that were born at different times. And when we did that, we saw some unbelievably long-term directional trends. A protein is this long chain of amino acids. There are 22 kinds of amino acids. The sequence in which they are arranged on a protein is determined by our genetic code. Each amino acid has different physical and chemical properties. Some of them repel water, some of them have an electric charge, and this causes tension in the chain, which makes the protein fold. We can use x-rays to take pictures of these proteins, and these images, which we call crystal structures of the protein, look beautiful. But the only problem is, proteins in our actual body look a little bit different from that. Most, a lot of proteins aren't like that. <laughs> a lot of proteins are amorphous messes which wriggle around and are a whole ensemble of structures and don't fold particularly nicely into one thing. So they keep changing. Yeah, you know, on very short time scales. Yes, the proteins move. They're not they're not like a crystal. They're not like a perfect structure that is just folded and stays in one folded state. Proteins move. And the degree to their to which they move is called their disorder. And what we see is that baby proteins are much more disordered than old proteins. When At you say baby, you mean... They were born uh, recently. Uh, in evolutionary time. Yes. So young, evolutionarily young proteins um, are much more disordered in animals than evolutionarily ancient proteins. And we looked at proteins that were born very recently and somewhat recently and less recently and fairly old. And to our surprise, we just kept getting a trend further and further and further back in time, which was completely unexpected. I did not expect there to be such long-term directionality in evolution generally because, you know, if something's going in the same direction, it tends to hit some limit, it tends to saturate, it tends to go as far as it can go. You know, and four billion years of life on Earth is a long time to be going in the same direction. So it never occurred to me to expect that. Uh, it was something that we accidentally saw while looking at shorter term trends and then just seeing how far back it went and it just kept going. Newer proteins are a wriggling, disordered mess when compared to older proteins, some of which have been around since Luca. That doesn't mean these new proteins are less useful. But this key difference between them told Joanna that something was going on that makes older proteins more stable over time. So once we saw it, I thought it was so unexpected that it was extremely interesting and I wanted to pivot my research program. She looked at this class of amino acids called hydrophobic amino acids. They repel water. And if you've ever noticed droplets of oil in water, you'll know what hydrophobic amino acids do when the protein chain folds. They come together. The final shape that a protein takes is very important for its function. Think of an antibody. It's a protein that is folded in a very specific shape so it can bind to other proteins on bacteria and viruses and neutralize them. And hydrophobic amino acids are very important for how a protein folds. We found another trend, which is if you look at the protein is encoded in a, in a straight line of amino acids put together, um, that we can quantify how much the hydrophobic amino acids tend to be close to each other, which means that they might form the nucleus of some kind of simple fold, even if the rest of the protein is disordered versus how much they tend to sort of be 
as far away as possible, as interspersed as possible. Just because they come together when the protein chain folds doesn't mean that the hydrophobic amino acids are all one after the other in the original chain. They can be dispersed. And so what we see in younger proteins is that they tend to have fewer hydrophobic amino acids, but on the proteins, the hydrophobic amino acids tend to be clustered together. So when they're clustered together, that forms the nucleus of folding or misfolding. And they're prone to misfolding, but they avoid it by not having too many hydrophobic amino acids. For older proteins with more sophisticated folds, they have more hydrophobic amino acids, so their fold is stronger, but they are interspersed along the chain. So there's this avoidance of having too many hydrophobic amino acids near each other. And misfolding is often, you know, during the process of translation, if there's a whole lot of hydrophobic amino acids near each other, that can form the nucleus for something you don't want. If you were to design a protein that retained all its functions, but had a more stable fold, you really want to think about where you're going to place your hydrophobic amino acids on the chain. It can be a double-edged sword. You want a lot of hydrophobic amino acids because they form a stable fold. But this can also cause the protein to misfold. And Joanna thinks that these older proteins have come up with this really sophisticated strategy of folding by dispersing their hydrophobic amino acids throughout the chain. So depending on when, how long something's been evolving for, it has different properties that keep going in the same direction for four billion years. To stumble upon something like this in your data, you need to be alert to the possibility of new trends and patterns that you weren't even looking for. But it's also really important that Joanna found this by accident. Because people have been looking for trends in evolution for some time now. The history of evolutionary thought is full of people proposing that there are certain directions and then that not those claims not standing up to scrutiny. So one of the common claims is called Cope's Law, and it's the idea that at least in, in animals, there's a tendency for uh, species to evolve larger body size over time. And there is some evidence for this in some taxa. The evidence for increasing size is patchy, and because we don't have fossils for everything that ever lived, finding that evidence may be tricky. But what about complexity? Surely it's common sense to say that organisms have become more complex over time. This is obviously true at some level that we started off very small, we started off very non-complex, and we're large and we're complex now. Uh, but again, the mechanism uh, is unclear. And what we mean by complexity is also often unclear. So is... And is the uh, does Cope's law also include increasing complexity and increasing size? No, unless you define complexity in such a way that it basically means size. Yeah. Okay. So Cope's law is about body size, uh, and complexity claims it's not always clear what is meant. Um, but I think the most common is how many different kinds of cell does an organism have. But that's body size. No, because you could have a large body with huge numbers of a, few, a small number of types of cells. So it's about types of cells. That's the most common. I mean, there's many ways to define complexity, but that's, uh, if you want a, 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 a definition that one can actually measure, <laughs> then that's one that's commonly used. Uh, although it's not trivial at all because what what are two cells what when are two cells the same type versus a different type isn't you know the the more we understand a particular species the more likely we are to say 
that these two cell type cells are of a different type and the less we understand the less we're going to ignore their subtle differences in type as these debates raged on using incomplete evidence unclear definitions and circular arguments joanna found it somewhere she wasn't even looking so the data is you basically download the genomes or sort of processed versions of the genomes from the hundreds and hundreds of species that's ultimately the data <laughs> once you have the genetic code you can figure out the sequence of amino acids on the proteins and we used animals because uh there's not a lot of horizontal gene transfer between species in animals if you were doing the same study in bacteria you don't really have a tree of what the species is doing in the same way because the genes go back and forth between species a lot so to reduce the amount of that that was going on i mean we still did filters to try and get rid of what there was but so that there was less of that going on we really focused on animal data they did something called phylostratigraphy it's a statistical method that allows them to compare genes across species and figure out when the common ancestor of those genes may have evolved in animals there are genes that can be traced all the way back to luca and others that have evolved more recently from junk dna the newer genes code for floppy proteins that have clumps of hydrophobic amino acids but older genes code for less disordered proteins that have amino acids dispersed across their protein chain so trying to fold without misfolding is an extraordinarily hard problem that we believe evolution has been trying to solve for 4 billion years and hasn't finished yet this doesn't mean that disordered proteins will one day disappear new genes are constantly emerging from junk dna producing disordered proteins If these proteins are useful to the organism they may continue to evolve with time and after another billion years they may become less disordered by which time they may even inhabit organisms that are as different from us as we are from luca I don't know about you but this conversation left me feeling really small and insignificant as though 4 billion years of evolution has just been this one long chemical reaction that's still going but it was also so fascinating to hear about joanna's research because entire species have emerged and died out in the span of time that her work covers her journey has taken her all the way back to the beginning of life now and she's trying to figure out how luca might have made proteins while she's not quite ready to share her results yet i for one am excited to find out what she's learned That's all from episode 3 of the Purpose Podcast. The Purpose Podcast is brought to you by the Biological Purpose Project. To learn more about the Biological Purpose Project, you can visit biologicalpurpose.org. Thank you for listening.